on Business Incorporated today. AFDB launches three-year bond, which is due on the 16th of December, 2024. Zimbabwean dollar weakens by 4.3% this week. Botswana's first iron ore mine begins production and delivers maiden exports to China. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Ini John Mekwa. As usual, we'll start with the market uh, in on the African continent. We kick off this midweek edition uh, from here, where mostly it was negative sentiment at intraday. Nigeria's main index was down marginally by 0.02%. Our South Africa's GSA index fell 0.15%. On the flip side, EGX, Egypt EGX 30 rose 0.51%, and Kenya closed yesterday's session negative. We go to the Middle East now, where major indexes traded in the red also. The Abu Dhabi main index was down 0.37%, while Dubai's index declined 0.35%. Elsewhere in the region, Saudi Arabia's main index fell 0.16% and Qatari exchange also fell. It was down 0.35% at intraday. In Europe, stocks were slightly lower this morning as investors digested corporate earnings, fresh economic data and a budget update from the UK finance minister. We'll have details and more reactions to that with Conrad joining us from Frankfurt. Hello, Conrad. Good afternoon. Hello, Amy. Good afternoon from Frankfurt. Good afternoon. So Europe's largest economy is growing more slowly than anticipated. Germany's government has lowered its uh, projections for growth again. How will this be felt most in the economy? Well, any, of course, uh, many companies that are very dependent on energy prices are suffering right now, and they will continue to do so at least until the prices for natural gas, for crude oil, for coal remain as high as they are. What's more, of course, companies that depend on parts from China are in trouble. Uh, China, as you know, is willing to close down its factories as soon as new COVID cases show up. And uh, when the factories can't produce, the ripple effects are felt here in Europe by companies that need those parts uh, to work and to operate. On the other hand, the recovery on Europe's services sector continues. And also, for example, on the German labor market, there are no signs, at least not yet, of slower growth. Uh, this Thursday, the German Labor Office has reported that demand for employees by companies remains high and continues to be on the rise. Well, uh, despite all the negative factors, uh, the German index is not very far away from its uh, latest record high shares in the U.S., the Dow Jones and the S&P 500 indices actually trading on record highs. How come? It doesn't, uh, doesn't explain it. Yeah, you're right. Uh, the optimism on a trading floor is very resistant. Um, you know, the price increases that everyone is talking, now, uh, talking about right now that has a flip side, a positive side for companies. For many companies, it means that they are able to demand higher prices for their products and services from their customers. So they make more money. And as a result, many of the earnings reports we've been getting so far for the third quarter have not only been strong, uh, they often have been much better than anticipated. And of course, this is you know, helping prices, share prices to keep up. What's more, uh, the hope for an economic recovery after last year's uh, lockdowns due to COVID uh, has not been given up on on the markets. It's only been postponed. Many experts, many economists, many investors are convinced that next year will be a strong one for the German economy, for the European economy. And that hope, that outlook, of course, is helping the stock market as well. Well, uh, it's also a mixed feeling with uh, Deutsche Bank, which reported about uh, an increase of net profits in the third quarter. But uh, its shares are one of the biggest losers today in Frankfurt. 
Why are investors disappointed with the earnings report? Well, of course, some of the losses of the share prices of Deutsche Bank this Thursday are good old profit-taking. You know, uh, buy the rumor, sell the news. Since the end of September, the share price of Deutsche Bank uh, had significantly increased. So this Thursday, a uh, number of investors took the opportunity to take some of these profits off the table. But also in terms of the earnings reports, uh, analysts had a few things to complain about. Deutsche Bank uh, performed uh, much less uh, well in its bond trading uh, department than uh, many of its competitors, in particular many of the American investment bank. Also the corporate bank at Deutsche Bank, the bank that does business with, uh, you know, business with, uh, with companies, in particular large companies, it's not been doing uh, significantly better than during the third quarter last year. It's only been performing on the same level as last year. So no uh, increase there, no uh, better situations there. And last but not least, Deutsche Bank uh, is much slower, obviously, uh, this uh, report shows, uh, in meeting its cost-cutting targets. These are a few factors that uh, analysts complain about and that prevent investors from buying the shares of Deutsche Bank this Thursday. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Conrad, for breaking that down today, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Ine. So let's move to the UK now. Finally, details of the budget is out, and we have Simon Pusey with the details joining us uh, uh, from our London studios. Hello, Simon. So, uh, could you give us some details from the budgets in the area of levelling agenda and economic recovery? Yeah, so Rishi Sunak has been um, giving a very upbeat message. Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, of course, saying his budget will deliver a stronger economy for the British people. He was keen to highlight that the levelling up agenda throughout his speech, which has been a constant message, really, of this government over the past few years, he opened his speech saying employment is up, investment is growing, public services are improving, public finances are stabilising, and wages are rising. So all very positive stuff. And the latter, really, is what the Chancellor wanted people to focus on with the announcement that the national living wage will go up from £8.91 per hour to £9.50. Another big boast was that the UK is recovering faster than its major competitors from COVID. He said the Office for Budget Responsibility has revised up its forecast for UK economic growth with GDP expected to expand by 6.5% this year compared to the 4% it had forecast at the budget in March. Lots of other announcements that, frankly, we knew were coming as they'd all been leaked to the media all week, the main one being that the National Health Service will get almost £6 billion to try and tackle the backlog of people waiting for tests and scans and appointments with doctors after the pandemic. The Labour leader, by the way, Keir Starmer, wasn't able to respond to the budget as usual, as it was today announced that he himself has COVID-19. So it was Ed Miliband, what a throwback that is, the former Labour leader, of course, who was at the dispatch box, and he said that with costs growing and inflation rising, Labour would have cut VAT on domestic energy bills immediately for six months. He said, unlike the Tories, that they wouldn't hike taxes on working people and he would ensure online giants pay their fair share. So obviously criticising what the Conservatives have done, but Rishi Sunak trying to put a real positive spin on the budget and saying that the UK economy is rebounding. Well, a whole lot to chew on now in the coming days. Any reaction from the market? Yeah, well, with all the briefings that have been taking place um, since the weekend, really, there was little in the way of surprises from uh, Rishi Sunak. The government had already released a lot of the announcements, including increases to public sector pay, that cash injection for the NHS, and investment in regional transport um, over the last few days, really, um, something that very much annoyed the Speaker of the House, Lindsay Hoyle, who once again berated the government for not telling MPs first. So no big surprises for the markets. At intraday, the markets were all slightly down the FTSE, all share down by 0.22%, the FTSE 100 down by 0.28%, and the FTSE 250 also down very slightly by 0.03%. In the 24 hours preceding the budget announcement, the pound had rallied to a fresh 2021 high against the euro and also registered advances against all of its uh, major indices. But at intraday, it was across the board, it was down as well, down against the dollar by 0.3%, uh, down against the euro by 0.24%, and also down on the yen by over half a all right, Simon, thank you so much for the update and enjoy the rest of your day.
Thank you. Uh, so, well, let's see what's happening in the other markets now. Uh, here in, in Asia, uh, shares in Asia Pacific were lower with Chinese tech stocks in Hong Kong seeing big losses. The broader Hang Seng Index in Hong Kong led losses among the region's major markets, falling 1.57%. Inland Chinese stocks declined on the day with the Shanghai Composite shedding 0.98% and the Shenzhen Component falling over 1%. In Japan, the Nikkei 225 closed mildly lower, while the Topics Index shed 0.23% to finish the day trading. South Korea's Cospi also slipped 0.77%, closing over 3,000 points. Now, shares in Australia closed higher as the S&P AX200 rose marginally to 7,448.70. And uh, oil prices fell early on Wednesday after industry data showed crude oil stockpiles rose more than expected and fuel inventories unexpectedly increased last week in the United States. Brent's oil features fell 1.31% to $85.27 a barrel after closing at the highest in seven years on Tuesday. West Texas Intermediate Features declined 1.54% to $84.39 a barrel after gaining 1.1% in the previous session. According to American Petroleum Institute, crude oil inventories rose 2.3 million barrels in the week ending October 22nd. That was more than the expectations for a 1.9 million barrel gain. Gasoline inventories rose by 500,000 barrels and distillate stocks increased by 1 million barrels compared with forecasts for both drugs. In the United States, uh, stock index features were a little changed during early morning trading after the Dow and S&P Close at record highs as earnings seasons continue. Futures contracts tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose uh, five points. S&P futures were off 2.5 points. Our NASDAQ 100 features dropped 17 points. Uh, well, to give us a summary of how the market went yesterday, we have Maria Bird, a correspondent in the U.S. The U.S. stock market on Tuesday eked out a fresh new set of record highs for both the Dow Jones and S&P 500. The S&P 500 was up over 0.2%, and the Dow Jones was up over 0.1%. The NASDAQ, which is heavily technology-laden, was not at its highest for the year, but it did eclipse its September 7th closing. It was just under 0.1% higher. It is clear that the stock market is moving in a direction that buyers are feeling confident in the American corporation's third quarter results. Even though inflation and potential slowdown in growth is pending, dependent upon the Federal Reserve policies that come out next week, many are still optimistic and hopeful that inflation and a slowdown in the economy does not heavily impact the stock market's growth. All right, Maria, thank you. Uh, let's go to the metals market now. Gold prices eased today, retreating from the key 1,800 mark as a stronger U.S. dollar and elevated bond yields dented bullion safe haven appeal ahead of key central bank meetings. Spot gold was down 0.2%, while U.S. gold features dropped 0.2%. The precious metal rallied to an over one-month peak late last week but has retreated 1.2% from those levels. Spot silver fell 0.8% to $23.95 per ounce. Platinum eased 0.7% and palladium edged 0.3%. We'll take a break now, after which we would have conversations on the African continent. This day with us is Business Incorporated on Channels Television. You're welcome back to Business Incorporated. Now, the president of the African Development Bank Group, Dr. Akiume Adishino, said that the lack of stable electricity in Nigeria is killing industries in the country. He based his comments on a report by International Monetary Fund, which indicates that about $29 billion is lost annually due to poor power supply. With 200 trillion cubic gas reserves, Nigeria should leverage on the potential for gas to play a big role in the energy sector. Well, let's talk to the managing director of ASICO Energy Holdings Limited, 
Mr. Felix Ekundayo on some alternatives which businesses should or have already started embracing. Hello, Mr. Ekundayo. Good afternoon. Yeah. I'm happy to be here with you. Good to have you. So the IMF places annual loss due to power supply challenge at uh, $29 billion. For you, does this capture it? I believe it does. I think um, what we are, uh, what they are reflecting is just a numerical representation of what we all feel. Uh, uh, generally, in terms of personal uh, uh, electrical supply, in terms of industrial, in terms of commercial, uh, even in the healthcare sector. There is what one might call a, the power emergency uh, uh, in terms of an inadequate level of power supply to uh, most of these critical sectors in the, in the economy. So, yes, I can, I can well uh, agree that the, the aggregate loss to the country is uh, uh, around those figures. All right, so um, the, Dr. Additional also talked about the abnormal becoming the normal. So talking about alternative now, um, we talk a lot about the potentials that we have. Uh, the gas sector is also one area where we say we have a lot of potentials. What solutions do you see lying fallow in the gas sector when it comes to the issue of power supply? Uh, with regards to how the, the, the gas and power sectors are intertwined, uh, it is in terms of uh, historically that they've been treated as different uh, parts of the, uh, the economy and strength. Uh, the power was totally separate from gas. It's the only time it, there was a, an attempt to harmonize this was under the heat of regime where there were there was a ministry of energy and such. Um, the challenge is that it, it, it means that you have different ministries pulling in different directions. So developments one might not necessarily be matched by uh, uh, provisions or, or strategic planning the other. In any event, uh, to answer directly the question you just answered, which is how can the gas sector play there are two aspects. There's the issue of uh, uh, more reliable pipeline natural gas, natural gas supply by pipeline to our existing uh, facilities. But this has this is the, the line we have told you for quite a, a, a number of years. Um, whilst the, there are challenges in terms of how that power, the central distribution of power uh, is being handled, which we, we don't see at any side of those challenges yet. The second aspect of uh, uh, how, how do these uh, problems get tackled would be in terms of distributed power, embedded power, uh, captive power. Uh, and each one of those has its own separate and distinct means. Distributed power means really we're not relying on a large national transmission grid as, as viewers may viewers already see. Uh, but we are relying on much more compact grids which serve localities, uh, communities, estates, uh, business or and industrial estates. Um, those kind of distrib distributed and captive uh, uh, arrangements, which is what my company specializes in, um, are beginning to come to the fore as consumers get very uh, frustrated with waiting for a national grid solution. It doesn't oh. mean that the two cannot work together to get the actually work in. All right, uh, Mr. Ekundayo, Mr. Felix Ekundayo, uh, uh, Managing Director of uh, ASICO Energy Holdings Limited. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us this afternoon. So moving on now, the African Development Bank, the AFDB, has launched and prized a highly successful 500 million pounds long three-year global benchmark bond, which is due on the 16th of December 2024. It's the second pound sterling benchmark transaction of the 2021 calendar year. The transaction was met with strong interest from onset and uh, by 10.30, AM, it had attracted an order book in excess of 220 million pounds, with a final order book standing in excess of 500 million pounds. The African Development Bank sets the size of its latest benchmark at 500 million pounds. This marks the largest benchmark in the 2024 maturity issued by a supranational in SSA space this calendar year.
Let's go to Zimbabwe now, where their dollar uh, weakened by 4.3% this week on the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe foreign exchange auction system as the official rate slowly catches up with parallel rate. A trading update shows that the official exchange rate hit 97.13 for a dollar, up from last week's 93.08 for a dollar. A total of 1,934 bids were submitted on both the auction platforms, with the bulk of bids coming through the SME's platform. On the main auction platform, priority towards revamping productive sector was sustained, with raw materials needs being allotted 13.9 million US dollars machinery and equipment 8.4 million US dollars. Consumables had 2.9 US million US dollars. Services 1.3 million. Retail and distribution 2.6 million. And Botswana's first iron ore mine, Ikongwe, has started production and delivered its maiden exports to China as a Southern Africa country makes headway in efforts to diversify its economy away from diamonds. Although diamond mining's contribution to the GDP has declined over the years and was less than 20% last year, Botswana is still heavily reliant on the precious stones, the diamonds accounting for more than 70% of foreign currency revenues. And three months after replacing the former finance minister, Tito Mweni, in a cabinet reshuffle, South Africa's national treasury has announced that finance minister will now present the medium-term budget policy statement on the 11th of November instead of the 4th, as initially indicated. The department says that the new date is as a result of upcoming local government elections set to be held on the 1st of November. Meanwhile, South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, has said that the state has identified three key priorities for climate action, including increased production of electric vehicles, reducing carbon emissions as ESCOM, and fast-tracking plans for a green hydrogen economy. Government has published a draft paper on a roadmap for increased production of a fully electric vehicles, which will be presented to the potential investors with the production of the cross seen as a more than just a vehicle coming off an assembly line. Well, that's it on the program. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I'm Amy John Mekma.